This program is brought to you by Emory University. So, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Brad Leschnauer, <clears throat> who needs no introduction. All of you know him well. Uh, Brad's primary role is as serving as director of the Emory Aortic Center. Uh, we have seen continued and steady growth in the aortic program, uh, really across all three campuses. Um, that has occurred uh, despite uh, Dr. Chen's uh, moving over onto Duke. Uh, and despite any really aggressive marketing efforts or anything like that, this is all organic growth, hard work by uh, our three dedicated aortic surgeons. Uh, and Brad has also had a focus on really expanding this into the basic science arena, which is something that I've been very interested in as well. Uh, he also holds an NIH grant uh, in the management of aortic dissection. Uh, he'll touch upon that uh, in his talk, and I will turn it over to Brad. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um, and thanks for everyone to, uh, tuning in today. I'm going to talk about contemporary management of acute type B dissection. We're going to talk about what we know, what we don't know, optimal therapy, and some research um, interests of mine that hopefully will provide answers to um, current controversies and questions. Okay, there are my disclosures. So a uh, brief overview just to refresh everyone's me uh, memory with respect to aortic dissection. There's two classification systems, the Stanford and the DeBakey. Uh, briefly, a type, uh, the Stanford is simpler. It's type A versus type B. A type A involves the ascending aortic, the, the ascending aorta, and a type B does not. That's kind of the, the simplest way to, to think about it. The Bakey has a much more um, detailed uh, description. So a De Bakey one involves the ascending arch and descending. A De Bakey two just the ascending. A Debakey 3A involves, begins at the left subclavian and ends just above the celiac. And a 3B is from the left subclavian um, extending past the celiac in various um, extents. Definitions, think of an acute uh, dissection as less than two weeks, subacute two weeks to two months and chronic greater than two months. And that, um, has to do not only with clinically how people do, but the uh, morphology of the dissection flap, which I'll touch on and show you a little bit in a slide. We think about type B dissection then in acute and chronic stages, and you can break them down into complicated and uncomplicated. Now, um, I'm just going to focus on acute type Bs today because um, it's too much information to dive into chronic as well. And really the unanswered questions lay right here in the acute uncomplicated, which we'll dive into here in a few slides. So again, some def definitions. An acute type B is defined as complicated really by two hard signs, rupture and malperfusion. And when we say rupture, it's not like they have, have a free rupture typically. Those patients probably die before they reach medical attention. We're really talking about a contained or impending rupture as defined by periaortic hematoma or an irregular contour. So here's two examples. You can see here, we, we see the aorta on CT scan with all this hematoma around the arch. And you can actually see a slight blush of contrast, which is um, usually you don't see that sort of smoking gun. On the sagittal here, it's really obvious. That's a rupture. That's what we'd call a rupture. And that patient needs to go, go to the OR ASAP. They can be surprisingly stable. It's amazing with type A's and type B's how the aorta can leak blood and almost seal itself transiently. It's quite uh, an amazing thing. Here is a contained rupture with an obvious left hemothorax. Now type Bs come in frequently with small effusions and it's not blood. It's, it's such a, uh, the body has an inflammatory reaction to the process going on 
that you'll get a sympathetic left effusion. Um, but it's usually small. When you see this, this is definitely blood. You can see hematoma around the esophagus, dissecting the esophagus out from the aorta um, here in the mediastinum. And you can actually see, I don't know if it's translating over Zoom, but there's a, there's a difference in the um, Hounsfield units here. Those are literally red blood cells because of gravity um, sinking down posteriorly. So that's rupture. Malperfusion is, can be a clinical or radiographic definition. If someone has a uh, diminished or absent femoral pulse compared to the other sides, malperfusion. Claudication, you can get, up, get them up and walk them and they'll start having pain, that's not normal. And frequently we will see a patient come in and they'll have um, acute renal failure, their keratinine will be up, their kidneys look normal. They may even light up with contrast on a type B. And frequently that's chalked up to, oh, well, they, they had a contrast load. Incorrect. And uh, we stented a lady last week just for this. We gave her about 24 hours. She was, we got her pain controlled, but her creatinine doubled in about 36 hours. We stented her and she poured out urine literally over the next 24 hours. It's, it's quite remarkable. Um, and then there's radiographic malperfusion, and that looks like this. So you'll get a CT scan, and one kidney won't light up. Or this is called massive true lumen compression or pseudocoarctation, where the false lumen, which is always the bigger lumen, is compressing the true lumen, and that results in diminished blood flow. Think of it as a lack of inflow into the abdominal aorta and to your visceral organs. Um, and, and that is also an indication for a stent graft or for treatment, I should say. Finally, if you're, uh, a patient comes in, it seems like they're not complicated, no rupture or no malperfusion. We typically put them in the ICU. We get their blood pressure under control, get them pain-free. And after 48 hours, we re-image them. If you see a rapid expansion in the aortic diameter, if you see a change in the false lumen status, that is an indication to stent these people. So that's the complicated cohort. And then there's uncomplicated, which we'll get to, including a, quote, um, cohort of patients with high-risk uncomplicated features. So the International Registry of Aortic Dissection looked at all patients with the diagnosis of an acute type B. Um, this is an old paper, <clears throat> and no matter whether they were complicated or uncomplicated and how they were treated, mortality was 25% in three years. That's, that's pretty bad. When you looked at patients who had open surgery for a complicated type B, the in-hospital mortality was close to 30%. Um, those with malperfusion um, made up about a third of them and the ruptures made up of two thirds of them. If you had to go to the OR emergently, the mortality was 40%. If you could wait them out, it dropped to 18%. And they stayed in the hospital almost a month. So clearly open surgery is not the ideal treatment for an acute complicated type B. I've probably operated on two that I can think of open because they didn't have appropriate anatomic landing zones for a stent graft. And when you open the aorta, this is one of mine, the aorta is, you can't even tell it's an aorta. That is all hematoma of a dissected type B. Um, and there's the repair. And you say, well, what's the difference? You, you repair type A's open, that's, that's the gold standard, and it still is. It is different in the left chest, be it the space that you're dealing with or anything. It's a much bigger hit. We can, we can get the tissues to hold stitches, but the patients don't do, it all, do well at all. Whereas a type A dissection, our mortality is about 10% for all comers, including malperfusion cases. So we've moved to stent all these, as many of you know, um, and it's revolutionized the outcomes and treatment for type Bs. And, uh, and I'll show you outcomes. So What's the goal in stenting a, an acute type B? The goal is to cover the primary intimal tear, which is at or just distal to the left subclavian, 
and thereby eliminate anagrade flow into the false lumen. And if you do that, it's a considered a, a success. What will happen is you will expand the true lumen, restore adequate inflow to the distal aorta, and um, you will eventually thrombose the false lumen, as I'll show you. What you're doing, in ad additionally, is you are relocating the dissection flap back to its native position. Expand the true lumen, thrombose, or hopefully over time, obliterate and shrink the false lumen. Now you have to use intravascular ultrasound for the stent. And you'll see here over here, that's the left subclavian. There's the tear. You can see it, obviously. Uh, right there is the tear. So it's a great shot, okay? And um, I'll let that play. IVUS is mandatory for stenting type Bs because it tells you where you are tells you you're in the true lumen and not the false lumen. You do not want to expand a stent graft into the false lumen. Um, that will cause problems. In addition to identifying the primary tear, it allows you to identify large second tears. It allows you to size your graft. You can do a whole case in somebody with renal failure without any contrast using IVUS. What's your algorithm with malperfusion? You cover the primary intimal tear and then reevaluate. We adopted a lot of our uh, techniques from the cath lab. We have sheaths in both groins. We measure pressures and compare the right radial artery, which is our true pressure, to our femoral pressures. If we need to, and typically we do, we stent all the way to the celiac and then reassess. And then we might need branch vessel stenting into the celiac, SMA, or renals. You may need an iliac stent. And if you still are not completely revascularized, you need to do open revascularization. Sometimes they may need a fem-fem bypass if you can't get the leg, but you have to get all of that open before you leave the OR. Rupture is a special situation. This is a, a, a clear case of a rupture here, an aortogram, but usually when they come in with a rupture or impending rupture, you do not see that site of extravasation on your aortogram. So you have to cover from the left carotid all the way to the celiac. Um, why? What you don't wanna do is do a limited coverage of the aorta, get upstairs, and then they get hypotensive and you don't know, did they just have a lability in their blood pressure or are they still leaking from their aorta? So you have to be aggressive with these things. And actually we've adopted techniques from TAVR and we now do these um, uh, ruptures awake because I lost a patient once when they came in, they were totally stable. We took them to the OR. I went to wash my hands, anesthesia induced the patient and the physiologic changes associated with um, induction caused the aorta rupture and we couldn't get it back. Let's look at a, a little bit of results here. Um, here's a paper we wrote they came out in 2017 of our first 51 patients um, that we stented for complicated Bs. We had two mortalities and a third at a year. These were all um, visceral malperfusion, mesenteric malperfusions with type B. But you can see low stroke, low paraparesis, no paraplegia, no renal failure. You should be able to get all these patients' kidneys to work, even if they come in renal failure. And we follow them. We follow them yearly. And, you know, there has been uh, the need to do 11 reinterventions, six open, five endovascular. I don't consider that a failure when you're talking about endovascular therapy. Um, it's the price and cost of doing business a little bit is how I see it. Um, as opposed to open surgery where you're taking the aorta out, the diseased aorta remains. Um, some of these open operations are also separate type A dissections, not caused by the stent, concomitant aneurysms, et cetera. When we look at how the stent graft remodels the aorta, it's quite remarkable. So this, where my pointer is, is the CT scan um, prior to diagnose, pri the diagnostic CT scan showing the type B on axial cut. When we move over here in panel B, this is now we've stented the aorta and this is prior to discharge, we get a CAT scan. And you see contrast in the false lumen. It's slightly uh, less intense or hyperlucent than what's in the true lumen. 
indicating that that's retrograde false lumen perfusion. It's not anagrade. Now we move over to six months. You see that contrast is largely gone. And in panel D at one year, look, you have one lumen. The stent graft has completely extended out to assume its own radial, because of its own radial forces and the false lumens obliterated. And that's been our experience with aggressive stenting from the left subclavian to the celiac. You can es essentially obliterate the false lumen in the chest and then you're just left with an abdominal aortic dissection to watch. And our, additionally, our experience is that other than connective tissue disorder patients, we have rarely ha had to re-intervene thus far on somebody's abdominal aorta if we've stented and stabilized and fixed the chest. Here's some data that I won't waste time, but it basically, we measured this in this paper, paper showing uh, false lumen status. Bottom line, you want to focus on how the numbers shift over to this complete and thrombosis or obliteration and the percentages get higher at one year. And the aortic diameter is stabilized. There's, a, there's some slight growth in the abdominal aorta, but again, 3.5 centimeters is not something we would, the, the abdominal aorta would have to get greater than five and a half centimeters before we would intervene. So we showed in this paper, low morbidity and mortality, excellent remodeling, um, stabilization, and you have to continue to watch them. But this is in, the, and this paper corroborates numerous other studies, which basically confirms that TVAR is the gold standard and should be, if you can, which is, again, I've only had to operate open on one or two now in 11 or 12 years of doing this. It's the treatment for complicated type B. I'll show you a quick case of ours just to highlight and emphasize um, how this therapy is, is a, was a game changer and remains. This is a 51-year-old who presented to an outside hospital, classic uh, symptoms, acute onset of sharp back pain and abdominal pain. As an aside, when you guys see dissections, a lot of them may be chronic. The history matters. The history matters tremendously because uh, often these are patients who've had dissections, they don't even know it, or they're residual type A's. And once this is uh, diagnosed on a CT scan, everybody sounds the alarms and freaks out. You've got to talk to the patient. All right, so the scan on this patient showed a type B, which I'm going to show you. On exam, he was a kind of obtunded. His abdomen was soft. He had no palpable femoral pulses, and he was aneuric. His creatinine was 2.5, his platelets were low, his lactate was forked. These are signs of renal and potentially mesenteric ischemia. Something bad was going on in his abdominal aorta. Here's the CT scan. You can see the true lumen is completely compressed as we go through. All right. And this is uh, now into the abdominal aorta. You can see just a sliver, really. Not too bad there. And then the 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 femorals aren't even dissected, but there was no pulse, highlighting that there's very little blood inflow to the abdominal aorta. So we took him to the hybrid OR. Um, we cut down on the pulseless uh, uh, right femoral artery, and we gained true lumen access, and we measured pressures. And you can see here the right radial artery, normal, 121 over 58, and that green flat tracing is not an error, and the pressure was 41 over 37, so no pulsatility. The left femoral was slightly better. So we IVist, we picked our stent graft, we um, shot a single aortogram in this patient with renal failure uh, and deployed it, and all of a sudden, immediately, boom, we have pulsatility in the right femoral arterial sheath and tracing. Um, it wasn't completely normal. So we extended down to the celiac. We marked it with IVUS, again, saving contrast. And now we had fixed it. So our right radial was 116 over 52 with a mean of 72. Here's our femoral artery tracing, 101 over 52, mean of 70. Um, we did shoot an aortogram to confirm that all the visceral vessels were intact. So we probably used 30 maybe 40 cc's of contrast for this case, malperfusion resolved. So 
when we do these cases, this is the other thing is it doesn't end by deploying the stent grafts. You have to be maniacal about the blood pressure as many of, of the people that have worked with me uh, know this. As soon as the first stent graft is deployed, you have to augment the systolic from once to what I tell the anesthesiologist is 160 to 200 go on pressors if you need it. Why? Because you're covering intercostal arteries that supply the spinal cord and you're eliminating those. So you need to count on collateral circulation from the vertebral arteries, from the, um, from the, um, the uh, internal iliacs to provide blood flow to the spinal cord. So you got to get that blood pressure high. So immediately we started seeing urine in, in this case in the Foley. We extubate all these patients if possible in the OR. Why? Because I want to know their neuro exam. I want to know if they can lift their legs. This guy wasn't moving his legs. So we call uh, our cardiac anesthesiologist can put lumbar drains on in, which is fantastic. Put a stat lumbar drain in the OR. In one hour, the guy's moving his legs. We drained him for three days, blood pressure, super high. 11 days later, he walked out of the hospital, palpable pulses, creatinine 1.8, fine. Here's his post-op CTA at one month. You see essentially the true lumen is expanded. There's some false lumen there, but it's largely thrombosed as we come down. Look, it, you can't even tell there's a dissection now. It's probably, it may have been gone in the visceral segment and all that looks normal. So this is actually how a typical complicated type B will look. Now, this is a dated argument. This is a dated document. And this is going to lead us into the real controversy of what's going on in type B. So this was a expert consensus of very well-known, famous, intelligent cardiac and vascular surgeons. And Craig Miller is a very influential, famous aortic surgeon at Stanford where stent grafts were developed. And what he said was emergency stent grafting with life-threatening complications of acute type B dissection may save many lives. And this could well become the most clinically valuable application of thoracic aortic stent grafting in the future. And I think he was right there. Um, as it, is stent grafts work well for aneurysms as well, but it is instantaneous, life-threatening, um, you know, resolving therapy for complicated type Bs. But he goes on to say in patients with uncomplicated type B dissection, medical management constitutes a benchmark that, we will, that will be difficult to surpass or even match by endovascular stent graft treatment. So this point right here is going to lead us into the discussion of uncomplicated type Bs, which is really still the controversy here. We know what to do with complicated, but should we be stenting or should we be medically managing um, uncomplicated type Bs? Well, to answer this, we need to step back and say, what data do we have on uncomplicated type Bs? And really what you're asking is, what's the data on medical therapy? OMT stands for Optimal Medical Therapy for Uncomplicated Type Bs. So we need to look back at natural history data. And what's the data on TVAR for un uncomplicated type B? Well, there's very little out there uh, as far as clinical trials. This is a very difficult uh, topic to attack, particularly now um, in a clinical trial, because, and I'll show you even in our own experience, in high volume centers with expertise, you can treat all acute type Bs with low morbidity and mortality. So this is what we're gonna dissect here in the last 20, 30 minutes here. First, uncomplicated type Bs. Again, this is now 10 years old, came out in Jack. Medical management in almost 1500 patients produced a very low in hospital mortality, 6.4%. That's gonna to be tough to match. But as you can see, at one year and really at five years, medical therapy starts to drop off. This is a paper out of the MGH um, looking at a little over 12 years and 300 patients with acute uncomplicated type Bs treated with medical therapy. Their mean follow-up was uh, four and a half years. 
And look at this, the medical therapy failure rate defined by either the patient died or had an aortic related intervention was close to 58%. When they looked at their cohort at six years, only 41% were still alive and were intervention for free at six years. Not good long-term data. Now, of those in their cohort that had an intervention, either open or stent, look uh, at what happens at two years, and I want you to remember the two-year mark, the survival curves start to diverge, and there's a survival advantage for those who got intervened. 76% compared to 59%. And this was statistically significant. The INSTEAD trial is a much maligned aortic dissection trial from the early 2000s when we were just figuring things out. It compared medical therapy to medical therapy plus TVAR. The problem with this trial is that the patients they were enrolled were actually a hodgepodge and not really acute dissection. Some were, but they enrolled people from day zero to up to a year of having a dissection. So really, this included acutes, subacutes, and chronics. And I'm going to show you in, in a few uh, slides why that matters. But this, this trial was considered a failure for stent graft therapy. When you looked at overall survival within 24 months after randomization, no difference in survival between stents versus medical therapy. There's no difference after two years um, between uh, aortic related mortality and stents. And there was no difference in progression of aortic disease. What you're really talking about there was aneurysm growth of the false lumen, okay? Dilatation. There was no difference whether you stented them or you did medical therapy at two years. Now, I will direct your attention back to what I just showed you. Only at two years in the MGH study did you start to see a divergence of the curve between those who had intervention or those who were medically managed. So two-year mark. After two-year follow-up in the INSTEAD trial, they looked at aortic remodeling, which is defined as true lumen expansion, false lumen thrombosis, and in those patients, nine, greater than 90% of patients positively remodeled in the TVAR arm. So this drove the decision to extend the follow-up of these patients. It was initially supposed to be a two-year trial only to five years. And these are the results of the five-year data from INSTEAD. And it showed there was a reduction with the TVAR group in all-cause mortality, um, 11% compared to 19%, not statistically significant. There was a 12% absolute risk reduction in aortic specific mortality, 19 to seven roughly. So that was statistically significant. And disease progression was also reduced in the stent graft therapy. And why is that? Because when you remodel the aorta, you're not gonna see a difference in mortality until after two years. That's what this data has taught us. So you can thrombose the false lumen and only after two years, as you move into the chronic phases of dissection, will it really provide a survival benefit. To that end, we looked at our um, uh, cohort of acute, well, all type B patients, um, almost 400 patients. These were quote de novo acute type Bs. And what I meant by that is that these are not residual type A's because this may be, there may be a difference in the pathophysiology you're dealing with. And here's a schematic of these 400 patients. 80 of them were complicated and got stented within 14 days. And then there was the rest of them were uncomplicated, about 318 who underwent medical management. And they were treated in a variety of ways, open surgery, TVAR, or 172 considered continued on the medical therapy pathway. So first, let's look at our in-hospital mortality. In the complicated type Bs, our in-hospital mortality was 
And it was no different than the uncomplicated type Bs, which was also 5%. And remember, the JAK meta-analysis I showed you of 1,500 patients, medical therapy produced an in-hospital mortality of 6%. So this addresses a couple of those previous statements that stent graft therapy would never approach medical therapy as a benchmark, all right? This, this proves, at least in our hands, that we can stent people, a sicker cohort, and achieve the same results. And that's borne out also here. This is an interesting Kaplan mile survival curve of the whole cohort. When we broke them down into complicated versus uncomplicated, those who were complicated and got stented up front by, by all um, means a sicker cohort of patients because they either had malperfusion or rupture. Look, they did better long-term. It wasn't statistically significant, but at 10 years, 84% were still alive compared to 59 in the medical therapy group. When you looked at um, those that were treated, again, acutely, these are all uncomplicated who got an intervention. The stent graft complicated group had a better survival than those who were managed medically and eventually needed open surgery, as shown in the dashed line here, or the chronics who got stented they did the worst, actually. They did worse than, than open therapy. Um, again, highlighting the potential survival benefit long-term if you stented these patients up front in the acute phase. So we replicated the MGH intervention-free survival curve. And in our hands for uncomplicated bees, at five years, only 49% of that 318 were still alive and did not need an intervention. And that dropped off to 30% at 10 years. So to sum up our experience, complicated bees undergoing TVAR, they do have excellent early and long-term outcomes. The natural history of uncomplicated type bees treated with medical therapy, excellent short-term mortality, but 46% of the cohort required intervention in the chronic phase. And as I alluded to, Intervention-free survival was 50% at five years and 30% at 10 years. And we went on to suggest that TVAR at the end of index hospitalization may confer a survival advantage and may serve as the optimal therapy for both complicated and uncomplicated acute type Bs, and we should be more aggressive. So now we ask the question with acute uncomplicated type Bs, what are the knowledge gaps? How are we going to solve them? Well, I'm going to try and solve them through some of our research. So let's break it down. And what do we know? Again, to emphasize this, medical therapy provides excellent survival at one year, but it drops off in the long term. What do we know? We know anatomy is important. When we think about high risk features of uncomplicated type B, we've identified that if you present with an aortic diameter of greater or equal to 40 millimeters, four centimeters, which essentially means you already have a significant aneurysm and you have a dissection, that's predictive of your aorta enlarging to greater than six centimeters, in which case you would need an intervention. The, we know the false lumen and its status is important. If you have a patent false lumen, it's an independent risk factor for increasing aortic diameter. There's data to suggest if your false lumen partially thrombosis, that's an independent predictor of mortality. Why? Because there, it's thought to, that the thrombosis is um, obstructing outflow from the false lumen and increasing the pressure in that false lumen. And if you have a false lumen or diameter greater than 22 millimeters, that also correlates with aneurysmal growth and mortality. We also are figuring out that the actual primary intimal tear is important. Both the size, greater than 10 millimeters, has been predictive of rapid growth, dissection, mortality, or its location. This is one of our general surgery residents now, but in his discovery uh, phase as an Emory Medical uh, student with me, we dove into the primary intimal tear, and he wrote this paper showing that if your uh, primary intimal tear is in zone three, and there's zones of the aorta, basically, if, if it's in the proximal descending, as opposed to if the primary tear was in the mid or distal, uh, 
that's predictive of significant aortic growth. And that's probably due to wall shear stress and the curvature of the aorta, and we're diving into that. But what don't we know about acute type B? We really don't know what percentage of the flow is going into the true lumen versus the false lumen. We have no idea about pressures in the true and false lumen. <clears throat> when I started out um, in complicated type Bs, I would put catheters in the true and false lumen and measure pressures, thinking that the true lumen's compressed, so the false lumen must be have a much higher pressure, and it didn't bear out. The false lumen may, may have been two to five millimeters of mercury higher, but it had something to do with flow. And as I alluded to, the importance of the primary intimal tear, both location and size, and the velocity of the initial jet of blood flow as it enters into the false lumen. I think wall shear stress opposite that jet is very important. So we've identified our knowledge, first knowledge gap, which is hemodynamic forces in the true and false lumens. How are we going to solve this? Well, I'm working with um, various people around our medical center. Um, John Oshinsky, Marina Piccinelli, um, Hannah Siebel are my team of CTA and MRI gurus right now. And we're trying to, um, we are gaining experience and data in 4D flow MRIs, combining that with the CTA. And this will provide us velocity data, pulse wave velocity data, which is a measure of aortic stiffening. It will give us wall shear stress, quantify that flow in the true lumen and false lumen, helicity, kinetic energy, stasis, flat motion. You can see here the flap moving. And in an acute dissection, the flap is very uh, uh, pliable. And we'll show that in a different slide. And then to quantify all this, and then there is an entity that you can calculate called a false lumen ejection fraction. <clears throat> so let's talk about the false lumen ejection fraction. This is a paper out of the Michigan group. And what they looked at were 15 patients with de novo type Bs, three with um, repaired type A's, so residual type A's. They did 4D flow. They calculated a false lumen ejection fraction. So you put your, your window in the 4D flow MRI over the primary intimal tear, and you calculate how much blood flow during systole is going down the false lumen, and you also can figure out during diastole how much flow is coming out of the false lumen. And then you uh, calculate a false lumen ejection fraction. And interestingly, this is two patients. They found that in a patient met, managed with medical therapy who didn't grow, had no growth rate, the false lumen ejection fraction was zero. But in a patient with a rapid growth rate, 12 millimeters per year, the false lumen ejection fraction is 51%. And the, this patient in type B had a very uh, large entry tear. So there may be something to this. These are areas we're exploring. This is a case report that recently was published at a Northwestern um, by Michael Markle's group, <clears throat> looking at a 40 flow MRI results in a 58 year old male who came in, classic acute type B dissection, treated with medical therapy because he was uncomplicated. They repeated a scan in 48 hours, totally stable. This is exactly what I would do. So that he was stable enough to get a 4D flow MRI, MRA. And they're, they're, this, these, this group has a huge experience with chronic type B. So they have a large institutional database of data and values to compare this. And what they showed in this particular patient was that the flow through the primary intimal tear, all these values, which mean nothing to me, were extremely high compared to their institutional data. Well, and this is, this is where that primary intimal tear is. And you can see expansion of the false lumen here. And the red indicates high velocities. Um, and, and what they showed, and what happened to this patient actually was 48 hours after the MRI, he ruptured and was taken to the OR, but died in the OR. So this, the point of this is that an MRI, 40 flow MRI could identify patients with really high risk features that should be treated, even if they're uncomplicated right off the bat. So what's our second knowledge gap? It's what I've been alluding to. Medical therapy versus stenting, what should we do? 
<clears throat> this is a paper uh, of ours we produced looking at our experience with treating uncomplicated type Bs, um, an eight year period, almost 150 uncomplicated type Bs. We stented 50 and we treated 96 medically. Look at that. All right, we, we know we can do this well. No mortality, minimal stroke, no renal failure, uh, transient paraparesis low. Look what happened to our medical therapy patients. A third failed medical therapy, 23 required stent grafts, and 11 had open descending orthoricos, and 13 additional patients died, giving us an overall all-cause all medical therapy failure rate of almost 50%. You know, we're starting to repeat themes here. You can see medical therapy is poor in the long term. So it seems obvious, right? Should we stent all acute uncomplicated type Bs? We could do it. It's, it's low risk. Why don't we do it? Well, in my mind, here are the pros and cons. It's a safe procedure in the right hands. You can improve aortic remodeling. And TVAR is more effective in the acute phase. And this is what I'm going to explain to you in the next slide. But what's the flip side of the coin? Well, while the risks are low, they're not zero with stenting type Bs. You can give a patient a stroke, you can paralyze a patient, and you can cause injury to their femoral arteries, all right? These stent grafts are extremely expensive, all right? $20,000 per stent graft approximately, and we're using probably two a case, maybe three. And then finally, there's data emerging, and we're diving into this topic that stent grafts, what happens when you put a stent graft in the aorta is it turns a compliant blood vessel into a lead stiff pipe. And what are the adverse effects of that on cardiac remodeling? What are the adverse effects of that on the proximal aorta? You know, I had a patient that I stented for a ruptured type B in December. That's exactly what she needed. And she had a concomitant five centimeter ascending aorta aneurysm that we were gonna let her recover from her, her ruptured B in December and maybe this spring do an elective aneurysm repair. She had a, an acute type A dissection uh, over the weekend and was treated by one of our former partners, Colin Morris successfully yeah, in Athens, and thank God he was there. And I wonder if that aneurysm, which had probably been stable for a long time, now had different forces placed upon it because we'd made the aorta stiff. Um, I don't have any proof of that, but it's come to mind. So why do we want to stent? What's the difference in stenting patients in the acute phase versus the chronic phase? So as you can see here, in the acute setting, the dissection flap is very thin, compliant, and mobile. There's less fenestrations. When you put a stent graft in that, you're going to expand it easily. In the chronic phase over here, it's thick. Look, it's not moving, all right? And it's, it's narrow. When you put a stent graft in that, it doesn't expand instantly. So the results of stenting dissections in the chronic phase are not as good. So what we really need is a crystal ball so that we could predict in these patients who have acute, uncomplicated Bs, which ones were going to fail medical therapy. And we'd stent those right up front because we know we can do it and get good results. And which ones don't need anything and leave them alone. That would be the ideal thing. Well, we don't have a crystal ball. but we, So we set out to study this in a rigorous scientific fashion. And I'm leading a, a group of um, Georgia Tech uh, biomedical engineers and our radiologist, John Oshinsky, in trying to create a risk score using clinical and uh, biomechanical properties of the aortic tissue and advanced mathematical equations, computational fluid dynamics, and 40 flow MRI to answer this question. So I'm going to briefly take you through in the last five minutes here. Uh, of the purpose of this, of our study. So the aim one is to identify clinical and anatomic risk factors that predict medical therapy failure. We're um, developing a, a highly sophisticated 500 patient database of all uncomplicated type Bs. 
we're using uh, a, a method called statistical shape modeling, as you can see here, which creates a shape library of your aorta so that hopefully when someone comes in, we put their aorta into this shape library that we have, and it may identify certain risk factors. We plug it into a machine learning model down here, and this will help us identify the most important clinical and anatomic parameters that are predicting medical therapy failure. Aim two will be to look at the biomechanics of the tissues as predictors. So <clears throat> our hypothesis is that a, a multifactorial machine learning model will integrate three data components as shown down here to predict false lumen aneurysm formation. So um, we are going to create fluid structure interaction models uh, of the aorta and, and validate these with our 4D flow MRI data. The biomechanical tissue testing comes from our Emory Aortic Tissue Bank, which we've been building over the last decade. These are actual tissue specimens, specimens taken out from open aortic surgery. We then bank them, and then our engineers over at Georgia Tech do a number of different tissue testing planar biaxial uh, testing, uniaxial failure testing. They peel the aorta apart and they do staining. And this gives us the material properties of that dissected tissue. We then uh, again are going to calculate uh, and create these patient specific fluid structure, structure interaction models that simulate the interactions between the dissected aorta and the wall and the hemodynamics and validate this with our 4D flow MRI data. And then AIM-3, we integrate the AIM-1 data, the AIM-2 data, so clinical and engineering, create this multifactorial personalized risk stratification model with machine learning, and hopefully use it to help guide decisions. So we anticipate that it will give us three patient cohorts. Those who have a low risk score, we can manage with medical therapy alone. And I have many patients I've been seeing now for over seven to eight years, their type B remains stable, doesn't grow, it's, it needs nothing. Those would have a low score. Those who fail medical therapy in the chronic phase, and by that I mean they either develop an aneurysm greater than five and a half centimeters or they um, have rapid growth, Hopefully those patients will have sort of the intermediate risk score. And then there will be a cohort that have a high risk score at the index of hospitalization. And in retrospect, those would be at high risk for dying of an aortic specific mortality and those we would stand up front. So these are my collaborators. It's a very exciting, interesting project. I hope in a few years I will have answers to these knowledge gaps I've identified. Um, and hopefully it will improve the treatment of uh, acute type B dissection. So with that, I'm gonna stop and I'm happy to answer any questions. Hey Brad, thank you. I think that was wonderful. Um, a quick question, you were talking about in the acute complicated patient, the need to stent graft, uh, for the stent graft to cover I don't know if you were saying cover the left common carotid or cover the left subclavian up to the left common carotid. In, in patients who are ruptured, where you don't know where the site of rupture is, I said you, you want to stent from, which I meant that starting from the distal edge of the left carotid, covering the left subclavian down. So, of course, we don't want to cover the left carotid. And what about... Uh, is there anything you need to do before or after with covering the left subclavian, both from so, an endoleak standpoint as well yeah. as perfusion? So in an elective um, case for aneurysm or a chronic dissection, if we need to cover the left subclavian, historically, we would do a carotid subclavian bypass to revascularize it. Um, and this has been the recommendations from at a society level. Actually, now there's there has recently been um, approval of the first, the Gore single branch stent graft that now in many patients 
it's got a portal for a left subclavian stent. You don't have to do the cross subclavian bypass. In an emergency, if you need to, you can stent the left subclavian, uh, or rather, excuse me, you can cover it. And um, I've maybe seen two or three patients over the years that have developed claudication in their arm. Usually the collateral flow is enough. The real danger I worry about is a posterior circulation stroke. So you need to just make sure when you cover the left subclavian that your right vertebral is dominant or is not an end artery. And most of the time, that's the case. Okay, thanks. Hey, Brad, it's Peter Block. Can I ask you a quick question or two questions? Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> Brad, uh, going back to the mortality data, if I looked at them correctly, it looks to me like when you were comparing medical therapy versus TVARs that the risk was still somewhere at two, uh, one to two years, around 50%, 40%, is that correct, of dying? Or is that the natural history of old people? Or is that something else going on that is related to their vascular system and so forth? And then the second question is, uh, you sort of glossed over that anterior spinal artery and the issues uh, that you have to deal with. Um, how easy is it to make that spinal cord work well afterwards? Okay. Um, so for the survival data, first of all, a weakness of every aortic study out there, which reviewers hit us with, rightfully so, is to get aortic specific mortality is incredibly difficult. So these patients may be dying. We may assume it's from their aorta, but we don't know. Right. Um, so that's one thing. So the survival at two years, I'm actually looking at that MGH study. I don't have it. I'm not sharing my slides, but it, with medical therapy, it's 80% at survival. It's, they drop off at really starting there, such at five years, survival is down to 60%. Does that answer that question? Yeah, that, that does. I, th okay. I think I probably looked at that, those data incorrectly, because I was going to say that's as bad as bad aortic stenosis, but clearly yes. that's not the case. Now, the spinal cord issue, so um, is, is very, very important, especially if you're going to cover the entire aorta like we do. And the vast majority of the time, permissive hypertension will increase the collateral flow and you'll be fine. But I send these patients out on no blood pressure medicine. So they leave after an acute type B, even with concomitant aortic disease, with blood pressures in the 150s range. And then we have a program where our aortic nurse practitioner sees them in two weeks and starts to slowly ramp up their blood pressure. But we've had situations when I, I, I alluded to a handful of patients that had trans, transient paraparesis in our own data. And what happened is they went to the unit and miscommunication occurred and they were put on labetalol to drop their blood pressure and they immediately lost their legs. And we had to immediately intervene, put them on pressors, put a spinal drain in, and we've been able to get their leg back. But it is a very dicey situation. Um, so the other reason when you cover a left subclavian, if you're planning to do it to in an elective fashion to do revascularization is exactly what you're saying, Peter, is to get that vertebral artery, robust blood flow from your carotid so that your spinal cord's protected. That's in my mind, much more at risk and more important than the left arm possibly becoming ischemic, which is extremely rare. Thanks. Brad, Andy Smith, um, could you comment on just your uh, thoughts about opportunities as far as process of care from when uh, patients develop symptoms to, um, you know, to how they eventually get to you and what are some of the mistakes that you might see? Well, um, they typically go to an ER and they get a scan 
and um, there, then the call goes out. And then it's what happens. It, it's a little bit of a bed availability. Um, and Brad, you can say it. You can just say it. <laughs> there's a, a lack of beds. And despite my uh, uh, efforts in trying to get a protected aortic emergency bed, given the volume that we do and the need for that, I have been un unsuccessful so far. Um, other institutions have this protected aortic bed, just like neurosurgery has a protected head bleed bed. Anyways, so, so the CT scan gets done and then you got to get them in and figure it out um, what they actually have. Because as we all know, the person on the other end, particularly in the emergency room, they, they don't have the familiarity. They don't necessarily know what they're dealing with, you know. We hear an aortic dissection, they often don't really know if it's type A or type B. So the ability to see the images real time, most of the time when we get aortic dissection calls, we ask the ER physician, take a video on your iPhone and text it to us. So we know what we're dealing with. Um, we have been able to, um, at Emory University Hospital, transfer patients directly to the OR. And that's been a huge time saver. And even if we don't have a bed directly, our ICU uh, physicians working with CCU, for example, and a lot of the other ICUs say, we don't have a bed now, but we'll make one. Get them in, and by the time you're done, we'll make it work. And they've been pretty good about that. Let's see, in the chat, um, aortic ulcers, Pooja's asked. Yeah. Uh, sometimes see reports. Yeah, we see these with like multiple, you know, aortic ulcerations or, you know, a possibility of ulcers. And I just never know whether we need to keep imaging uh, these or what is your- I would opinion? say if they remain less than a centimeter after two scans, they're, they're usually fine. And if you want to image those, you can you can even do them non-contrast, but after a year stability with those, we we've rarely had to treat those. And you just leave them on aspirin and Plavix if they're on it for other reasons. Yes, I yeah, I don't think you need to change their anticoagulation strategy for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we have a lot of bandwidth, as many of you know, with our. Um, uh, aortic nurse practitioners at all three hospitals to conduct surveillance clinics for any of these patients who come into your practice and you want us to manage that particular aortic uh, uh, issue, we're happy to do it. Great, thank you. All right, if there are no other questions, it's right at 8.30. Uh, don't forget to get your uh, CME credit and uh, I will see everyone next week. Thank you. Thanks everyone. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.